Hello there. Uh, welcome to this webinar. This is the case for permaculture with myself, Bill Wilson, of Midwest Permaculture. This is actually the first webinar in the eight-part series we call the Foundations of Permaculture. Um, this is the webinar series that all of our students take who take one of our permaculture design certification courses. But this first webinar is also the uh, webinar we used to create the 18-part YouTube series. It's a free YouTube series on the internet, and um, some of you are choosing to purchase it in its entirety, and so that's, um, that's exactly what this is for you. You're getting it as well. Um, the, for the eight-part series, I will introduce each of the webinars as they come along, so I'm not gonna take the time to do that now. But I do wanna mention a couple things about this webinar. One is, it, um, it represents the backbone of the talk I give. It's called the three hour introduction to permaculture and I've given this talk many places. And it represents some of the most uh, salient or uh, impactful pieces of information that I've been able to pull together as I give these talks and I find pieces that really seem to penetrate or work. I keep those in my talks and um, so consequently I, I get a lot of positive feedback from people saying, uh, that this webinar or this series or this, excuse me, this talk helped them understand what permaculture was and what's it about. So I'm, I'm delighted that you're here. I'm delighted you're listening to this and part of it. And you're getting the best I've got to share when it comes to introducing this this concept of permaculture. Permaculture is a big thing. It's uh, It's not just about landscaping and about putting plants in your environment and coordinating animals in your backyard. Certainly that's an important part of it and really some of the beginnings of permaculture, that's where it started is in the immediate landscape and how do we provide for our needs in the immediate landscape. But over the decades, it's really, it's a hyphenated word of permanent culture. What are all the things we need to do to create a permanent culture? So it deals with energy, it deals with um, the built environment, how we build our homes, it deals with water, how do we get it? How do we use it? How do we pollute it when we're done with it? Uh, it also includes more of the inner work or the uh, the personal journey. Is the work you're doing in your life, is it meaningful to you? Do you feel like it's making a difference in other people's lives? Or are you just plugging in, just making a living? And what about your relationship, your relationships, your relationship with others, your relationship in your community, your relationship with yourself? Do you feel like it's... Um, an authentic expression of who, who you are, or are you just kind of going through the motions and sometimes just feeling lost that you don't really know what you're doing. Permaculture is about all of this. You know, the foundational ethics is care of people, care of planet, the benevolent distribution of goods or surplus, the sharing the surplus, or I like what Starhawk says, care of people, care of planet, care for the future. Are we creating a world that works for everybody? Are we creating a world where we're leaving the planet in better condition than when we arrived? Or are we consuming it and polluting it? Permaculture is the journey and how do we live on this planet in such a way that just as the Boy Scout comes into the campsite and they're told, leave this campsite in better condition than when you found it. Permaculture is the way or the path by which we can come in as generations onto this planet, live a full and bountiful life, but when we leave, leave the planet in better condition than when we found it. That's the goal of permaculture design. And that's the goal of the work that we're doing here you know, with Midwest Permaculture and many people who are involved in permaculture. How do we do this? Let's do this in such a way that we don't pollute the planet and let's figure out a way to take care of everybody. So thank you for your interest in permaculture and welcome to this webinar series. All right, well, here's basically what we're gonna cover. Um, we're gonna talk about what permaculture is. We're gonna talk about the case for permaculture, why we need it or why it would be useful at this time in our lives. And then what does it look like? What, what does permaculture, uh, you know, how does it look on the ground? Um, one of the things about this presentation is um, I've given a lot of these talks and 
I've tried to um, you know condense permaculture into shorter and shorter times than I can do it. But what you're going to be getting here is, uh, you know, minus the video that I that I show of Bill Mollison, this is the full three-hour presentation uh, that I give. I also pull out a few other pieces that I know we're going to be covering in detail, and a lot more detail in the design course, so there's no reason to touch on those tonight. But uh, slide number three here, Dr. David Suzuki, um, he's well known in, the, um, in Canada. He's uh, been an environmentalist for 30 years, a geneticist, but he made this interesting quote. He said, what permaculturists are doing is some of the most important activity that any group is doing on the planet. Um, that's pretty high praise, but he goes on to say, we don't know what the details of a truly sustainable future are going to be like, but we need options. We need people experimenting in all kinds of ways, and permaculturists are one of the critical groups that are doing just that. And as we go through this presentation, we'll, we'll get a better idea of what it is he's talking about. But um, I'm guessing that some of you have told your friends that, uh, oh, I'm going to go take a, a permaculture course. And uh, they kind of look at you, kind of tilt their head, and they go, well, what, what's that? What's permaculture? And um, if you were like me in the early days trying to explain it, uh, I kind of stumbled over my words. And by the time I was done, they really didn't know anything more than when I had started. Um, so let's talk. Let's just go over a few quick definitions. Here's a, a simple one that I like: um, permaculture or permanent culture. It's a creative and artful way of living, where people in nature are all preserved and enhanced by thoughtful planning, careful use of resources, and a respectful approach to life. And uh, thus, embraced these attributes create an environment where all may thrive for untold generations. That's really the goal: is to create something that lasts a long time. Uh, the next slide is Bill Mollison's definition of permaculture. Very simply, he says, within a permaculture design system, uh, wastes become resources, productivity and yields increase, work is minimized, and the environment is restored. Um, permaculture, as you know, comes with um, a variety of design principles, and depending on uh, who you're um, studying from or what books you're, you're, you're looking at, um, there's anywhere from uh, a half a dozen to 18. But um, these are the these are the highlights. These are the the key ones that uh, um, that I like: uh, observe and connect, use biological and renewable resources, catch, store, recycle energy and materials. Uh, you can read the rest. But you'll notice there's nothing in there that is new to most of us. It's all common sense. Permaculture is not something that's totally new and created uh, out of the blue. All permaculture was or is. It's a system by which um, we take the best of indigenous cultures with common sense science approach to solving problems, blend them together in a way that is cakes, care of planted and people, and you've got permaculture. So very simply put, slide seven, permaculture is just a design system whereby we find ways of living to allow for permanent cultures to exist, where all humans live abundantly well while leaving the planet in better condition than whence we found it. Um, quite simply, um, you know, I was a Boy Scout, and we were always taught when you come to a campsite, observe the campsite, and leave the campsite in better condition than when you found it. And that if each generation of humans, you know, as we come into the planet and we have our life experience, if we left the planet in better condition than when we found it, we'd be living pretty much in utopia today. So that's, in essence, what, what we're trying to do with permaculture design. But, you know, history and logic will demonstrate that if you're going to have permanent culture, first, you've got to figure out how, a way to have permanent agriculture. So let's take a few minutes and explore uh, agriculture, industrial agriculture, as, as it exists today. Uh, again, we're going to look at principle number one. We're basically going to do observe and connect. There's, there's not a lot of judgment involved here. We're just looking at what is, what's so, what are the conditions we find ourselves in, and what are the results of our actions. So this is sort of the scientific approach to analyzing it. Uh, the first thing I, I thought was interesting, um, I, meant, I uh, was talking to a friend of mine who works at the University of Illinois in, in, uh, in the Extension Service in Agriculture, Sustainable Ag, and I said, Dan, you know, if I wanted to farm full-time, because a lot of farmers I know have a job off the farm because uh, you need a lot of acreage to be able to farm. But I said, if I wanted to farm full-time and not have a job off the farm, just, you know, strictly, you know, run the tractor and, and raise my crops, how many acres do I need? He, and he says, well, basically you need a square mile. It's 640 acres, and a square mile, pretty much you can be sure, you know, uh, over a period of five to ten years, you'll average, you know, that fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year worth of income for uh, working full-time. 
Well, you know, for for what it's worth, in this picture here, um, the, actually the corner of this intersection, all the mile, all the roads out here in Illinois are on a mile grid. So the, those corners behind me, this is our dog Macy in, in the middle of the picture there. But if you follow the road all the way as far as the eye can see to the horizon, there's a little stick to the right of the road. That's a telephone pole. That's one mile. You would need to own the land to the right all the way from where you're standing all the way to that pole and then a mile to the east and a mile south and a mile back west again. It's a massive amount of land. What's interesting is we have a good friend who uh, is doing uh, uh, organic uh, vegetable raising um, you know, in central Illinois. He's um, He's got 10 acres of land, and he makes more money than the person with 640 acres next door to him. He uh, was on 10 acres. He owns his house now. He owns his land. He owns all of his equipment. He's incredibly profitable on 10 acres of land. What's also interesting about Illinois, you know, we have some of the richest farmland, not just in the United States, but richest farmland in the world in Illinois. There are people in other parts uh, of the world, uh, you know, farmers that go to sleep at night and they dream about Illinois farmland. I mean, that's how perfect or wonderful this, this farmland is. But in the state of Illinois, we import 93% of all the food that we eat. Richest farmland in the world, and we only grow 7% of Illinois' food. That should tell us something there. The next slide shows a picture of a field and talks about humus content. Uh, when these prairies uh, soils were, were opened up 150, 200 years ago, the humus content was uh, 10 to 13 percent. That's pretty typical of native soils, even wooded uh, soils. Uh, 10 to 13 is pretty typical. Um, you need, uh, you know, humus is the, um, it's the organic matter. It's the, um, it's the leaves that have fallen on the ground and the dead logs and the sticks, all the the material that was once growing vegetation falls to the ground and it starts to rot down. And it's the humus that provides food for the, for bacteria in the soil. It is also the humus that is the sponge of the soil. It is what holds water or moisture to provide uh, water to the plants. Well, you have to have 3% humus content just for biological activity to exist. You drop below 3%, there's not enough food for, the, for the, most of the biology in the soil. Well, the humus content today of commercially farmed soils across the United States falls just below 1%. Uh, in Illinois, it's a little higher than that. It's like 1.3 to 1.5%. But across the U.S., it's under 1%. And that's because of the way we farm. Annual agriculture requires that you turn the soil every year, over and over again. You turn the soil, and every time you break open the soil to create a seed bed for your annual seeds, you end, up dump, dump, you end up dumping oxygen into the soil. It's just like when you have a, a wood-burning stove and you open the door and oxygen goes rushing in and the flames um, flame up. It's the same thing with the soil. Uh, bacteria needs uh, water, food, and oxygen to leave. They're, they're animals. They, they need all three to live. And when you dump a bunch of oxygen into the soil, it, the uh, bacteria count multiplies the they uh, reproduce incredibly rapidly, and they consume all the humus. So it's, it's, it's amazing, but it only takes about 8 to 10 years, and you'll drop your humus content from 10% down to about 2 to 3%. And then on top of that, industrial agriculture, because we use herbicides, pesticides, and particularly the ammonia, uh, the nitrogen fertilizers, uh, it kills um, all kinds of um, uh, microbiology in the soil. And so you end up with a very inert uh, substance. Basically, you end up with, with dirt. Um, the next picture, slide 10, is a picture of a barge moving down the Mississippi River with corn and, and soybeans in it. Um, I like to ask uh, students, and if you, got your, um, if you buy your uh, computer, if you type it in, what do you think the number one export is in the United States? I'll go ahead and type it in. Let's see what you all come up with. And, and when I ask that question, I'm talking about in tonnage. Um, somebody said it's probably jobs, and who knows, maybe it is jobs. But I'm talking about just volume, you know, just truckloads or boatloads. What do you all think uh, is the number one uh, export in the United States? <clears throat> yeah, corn is, the, is, the, is, is one of the highest ones. That's what most people suspect. So anyway, it's not corn. A lot of people think it might be um, soybeans or wheat. It's actually topsoil. Um, if you were to go to the mouth of the Mississippi River and scoop up a gallon of water, put it in a centrifuge, 
you can measure the suspended solids in that gallon. Then you multiply that times the millions of gallons of water that moves out of the mouth of the Mississippi River, and you end up with a truckload of topsoil every three to 10 seconds, depending on the time of year. If you look at the next slide, this is pretty startling. Um, just from 1997, they said the amount of topsoil that we lose in a year in the United States, just one year, is 1.9 billion tons of soil. And once again, it's, you know, how do you, com how do you compute that into something that makes sense? Well, they go on to explain that if you took a train car and loaded 1.9 billion tons into a train car, it would wrap around the globe seven times. That's approximately 170,000 miles long. That's how long the train would be. That's one year just in the United States. That's how much topsoil we lose. That's our precious resource. That's the birthright of future generations, and we're losing it because of the way we do annual agriculture, which is turning the soil every year. Look at the next couple of pictures here. Um, this is just two years ago. I was out with a, uh, for a walk with Macy early one morning. We had a, a one-inch rainfall that night, but instead of it coming gently all night, it came quickly. It came in a, probably a 45 minutes, a thunderstorm, came through real fast. And look at the next picture. This is just, you know, half a mile down the road from us. And this happens all over the, the United States. Every time there's a big downpour, you have these washouts. Um, the other situation you have um, is uh, wind erosion. Um, slide number 13, um, when you turn the soil every year, you're exposing the soil not just to uh, uh, rain erosion or water erosion, but to wind erosion. Uh, there's a period of time when the soil is very vulnerable, and if it dries out and you don't get enough rain and the winds pick up, you'll start moving soil around. If you look at the slide 14, here's a report from Cornell University or an article from uh, uh, 2006. It said two inches of, snow, of soil blew away from croplands in Kansas during the winter of 1995 and 1996. Uh, if you look at that picture, that black thing to the left, that's a Swiss army knife laying on its back. And what you're seeing to the right of it is a plant. The, uh, the big stalk on the top is the plant itself, and that's where the soil was, those little fingerlings coming down. Those are the roots of the plant that you're seeing there that are now exposed because two inches of topsoil have blown away. And that's, one, that's just one winter. During the Dust Bowl years, we were losing um, an inch of topsoil every eight years across the country. Today, we've got that down to only we're losing an inch of topsoil every 25 years. The United States and Canada, the North American continent, since we opened up these soils with the plow, call it you know, 200 or 400 years ago, depending on where on the continent you are, we have lost or consumed, if you will, half of the topsoil on the North American continent. There are a couple of great books um, written by, um, one by Jared Diamond called Collapse, the other one Against the Grain by Richard Manning. And they document how the culture of annual agriculture and followed with animals, intensive grazing, have always, always, always consumed their topsoils. It's just a few cultures that have figured out a way to do annual agriculture and add or build topsoil at the same time. Most cultures have lost their topsoil. And when you lose your topsoil, you lose your culture. Um, you know, the Middle East and most of northern Africa were once very, very fertile areas, three to 5,000 years ago. I mean, this is the birth, supposedly the birthplace of the human experience, the Garden of Eden. But because of annual agriculture, um, those were basically turned to wastelands. So we are on the way there. The North American continent is on the way there. Uh, we got a couple hundred more years to go, but uh, obviously we still have soil to work with. I'd rather work with the soil we have than start from sand or start from stone. If you look at slide 17, this is um, a picture of a, um, a bean field just uh, half a mile down the road from us. And um, uh, you can just, I would just want you to get a, a sense of you know, how vulnerable that crop is to uh, uh, erosion, uh, wind and rain erosion. But um, the other thing I want you to, to notice is um, the, look, look at the crop here. Look at the date on here. This is June 22nd. This is the first or second day of summer, right? And how much photosynthesizing is happening in that field right there? Look at the trees in the background there. Those trees have been photosynthesizing since um, 
you know, April. Uh, the uh, evergreens in there will photosynthesize all winter long. In photosynthesis, obviously what you're doing is you're pulling carbon out of the air, you're creating biomass, you're respiring, you're putting oxygen into the air. You're actually doing something positive on the planet. You're building wealth, you're building soil, you're harvesting carbon and producing oxygen on the planet by this process of, of photosynthesis. But the bean field hasn't even started. How much photosynthesizing is happening there? Practically nothing. If you look at the next picture, it's exact same, standing in the exact same spot, but a year later. Go back and forth between the two. You look at the trees in the background, and then look at the corn with the trees in the background. Same spot, and look at the date. This is the end of August. This is the next year's corn, beans, corns, beans, corns. This is a pretty typical rotation. But this corn is already fully grown, and it is... Um, in the process of becoming dormant, the uh, heads, the uh, ears of corn are drying. How much photosynthesizing is happening in that field? Practically nothing again. But the trees are still photosynthesizing. Even the grass in the foreground is still processing. And look at the next slide. I'm on 19. Here's the same picture again. I want you to notice something else here. Look at the foreground. You see the grass? I'm standing on the road, and this is the grass in the ditch. I didn't even notice this when I was taking the picture but this is the grass in the ditch at my feet. The seed heads on this grass are already mature. That, gr that grass is distributing its seed already. It's gone through an entire reproductive cycle, and that bean field hasn't even begun yet, or hardly begun. You might consider this uh, agricultural desert land because it really isn't doing much work yet. Now, I'm going to take my camera, and I'm just going to turn around. There's a ditch behind me. Uh, or a ravine, which is a, um, an, uh, a runoff ditch where they move water off the landscape. Look at the next slide, slide 20, and take a look at the, the vegetation in there. You can see the bean field in the upper right-hand corner. Now, this ditch, other than when it was dug, you know, back in the 50s or 60s, or the last time it was dredged or cleaned out, and maybe they threw in some seeds, other than that, nobody, you know, tills it. Nobody herbicides it or weeds it or pesticides. No, nobody even looks at this ditch except the fall when they go pheasant hunting. This ditch is forgotten. And yet look at the amount of vegetation in there. What we attempt to do with permaculture design is to find a way to duplicate systems like this that grow themselves, that do the work themselves, and yet provide a bountiful harvest for us. Throw an apple tree in there, for example. Just throw an apple tree in there and imagine it's mature. And every, you know, spring, you don't even, you don't touch it, you don't look at it, but you show up around, you know, July 1st and apples are starting to form in this tree. Some early varieties will actually be producing apples in July or August. And you just start harvesting apples. So imagine you had 20 other varieties of crops in there, all of them doing all their own thing, and all you do is come along and harvest. There's a good design for you. But the other thing we need to talk about when we talk about agriculture is we have to have a, a bit of a conversation about uh, oil or peak oil. Most of you have heard that term, peak oil, before. I wasn't aware, but look at this statistic. A third of all the oil and gas consumed in the United States is used for food production, and that's from seed to plate. Um, many of you are aware that the average... Uh, the food on the average American plate has traveled 1,500 miles. Some people say that's that's much higher now. It's like 18. You know, actually, I, um, I found in the store, Becky and I were in there uh, about a month ago, there's garlic from, from China uh, being sold in uh, in the grocery store. So we're we're flying food all over the planet uh, trying to get it to, to, the, to the markets. But the number that really catches my attention is uh, on the lower right-hand side of the slide there. There are a variety of studies out there, but these are the numbers that that I've come to rely on. But it says it claims that it takes 7.3 calories of energy to place one calorie of food on the American table today. Uh, the farming aspect of that is two to three calories. That's just to grow the food and get it in the elevators. Uh, and then it takes another four calories or so to take it to market, process it, package it, cook it, put it on the table. So consider these numbers. I mean, if it if it takes, you know, seven calories, eight calories of energy to put one calorie of food in our body, what happens when the price of energy doubles or the price of energy triples? What does that do to the price of food? The price of food and the reason we have such inexpensive food in the world today is simply because of the massive amounts of energy contained 
in carbon-based fuels, particularly in gasoline or in, in oil. You take away the oil, you take away modern industrial agriculture, and we've got to find other ways of growing food than converting oil into food. Here's a quote on slide 22. Estimates for total recoverable oil on our planet are about 2 trillion barrels. You know, how much oil is there? They say there's 2 trillion. Now, on a cumulative basis, we've pumped out 1 trillion. Now, the majority, what I've been told, the majority of geologists agree, it's 2 trillion. There are some that say that's way too conservative. It's 2.3. Maybe one person I read article said they think it's more like 2.7 trillion barrels. But the point is it's in that 2 to 3. Most agree it's 2 trillion barrels. Now, where does this quote come from? You know, here's some typical liberal magazines, probably some of you read these, Mother Jones, Rolling Stone, Audio Reader. It comes from Financial Planning Magazine. Look at the next line. That's October 2005. People who watch money watch the oil. Everything in our culture that makes it run the way it does is dependent upon cheap oil. And how much oil is there? We talked about there's $2 trillion. And where does it come from? If you look at slide 24, I think, there are 98 oil-producing nations on the planet. These are where, this is where we found oil on the globe. Today, 64 of those have already hit their peak. The United States has never produced as much oil as it did in the year 1970. That was our peak year. Since 1970, we've been producing less, less, and less oil. That includes uh, Alaska. If you look at the next slide, 25, this, is, this was the slide I remember seeing this chart, and this is when I had my peak oil moment. These vertical lines represent the billions of gallons, excuse me, the billions of barrels of oil that are discovered in a given year. Uh, for example, look at 1948, 49. We're discovering 50 and 55 billion barrels of oil in a given year. The black line represents the billions of barrels of oil that are used on a global basis. So around 1948, 49, we're discovering 50 billion barrels a year, but we're not even using 5 billion barrels, more like 3 to 4 billion. But follow that black line up, and as we continue to use more and more oil on an annual basis, we're also discovering less and less and less oil every year. If you look at this point of 1980, we have never discovered as much oil in any given year as we have consumed in, the, in each given year. That's peak oil right there. Look at this next slide. Big headline. This was last year. I saw this in the newspaper, and I pulled it out. It says, Brazil thinks it has found a massive oil field. This is out in the ocean. By the way, used to be we would drill our wells about, um, about a half a mile deep. Today, the average well is over five miles deep. Um, Brazil thinks it found this massive oil field off the ocean, off the coast in the ocean. They estimate 33 billion barrels of offshore oil. Largest find in the world in decades. That's from the Associated Press. Now, if you go back to the chart, we're using about 28, at this point, we're using about 28 billion barrels of oil a year. How much oil was discovered in Brazil? 33 billion? That's a little over. That's one year and some change. We discovered one year's worth of oil off of Brazil. And when I start playing with these numbers of trillions, you know, I have a hard time, slide 27, asking this question, you know, well, how much is uh, a billion barrels uh, or trillion barrels of oil, or two trillion? Um, I mean, if I had it all in front of me, standing in front of me, and I could just look at it, what would it look like? Would it fill the Indian Ocean? Would it fill the Mediterranean Sea? Um, well, the only body of water I'm familiar with is the Great Lakes system. So I decided, well, I'm going to find out how much water is in the Great Lakes system. So how do you find that out? Uh, like any good American today, I go to Google and I type in how much water is in the Great Lakes system. Literally, that's exactly how I did it. It took me seven seconds. And the reason it took me seven seconds is because I'm a slow typer. And I get a number. All right? Look at the next slide. Um, you know, the Great Lakes Board or panel, whatever it is, it says there are six quadrillion gallons of water in the Great Lakes system. Now, I'm in big trouble because I have a hard time getting my head wrapped around a trillion. Now, i got to get a head, a head wrapped around a quadrillion. But they said it was a six with 15 zeros. So I write that down. Then I divide it by 42, which is the number of gallons of oil in a barrel. This is to get the barrel conversion. And I come up with 143 trillion barrels of water in the Great Lakes system. 
How many trillion barrels of oil is there on the planet? Two, 2.7. If you look at the next slide, all the oil on the planet would not even fill Green Bay. If you look at the word Wisconsin there, for those of you who aren't familiar with Green Bay, it's that little finger of water that uh, sticks down um, uh, by the letter N there. All the oil on the planet would not even fill Green Bay. So oil is a finite resource. You know, there's a certain amount of it on the planet, and when it's gone, it's gone. Or when we, as we consume it, it's going to become more and more valuable. And it is the same with coal. It is the same with natural gas. It is even the same, should we decide to go down the route of nuclear, it is the same with uranium. All of these are finite resources. And with world populations increasing and with the consumption that we do and the demand for these sources is increasing, all of these will all reach a peak. Will we see it in our generation? Who knows? But who cares? It'll, be, it'll happen in somebody's generation. So let's take a look at what is it that makes oil so valuable. What's the big deal? We'll find another thing. We'll throw a solar panel on top of a truck, and my gosh, we'll just run down the road. Well, it's not that easy. Uh, sunlight is uh, very powerful energy, but it's very diffuse. It's very hard to get a, a, lot, a lot of it concentrated in one space from a small space. But oil... It's got this massive amount of energy in this liquid stu substance. Um, you know, I was a truck driver for quite a few years, and you c I can move a, uh, a truck uh, from experience. I know I can move an 80,000-pound tractor trailer, uh, you know, up a shallow grade five or six miles on a single gallon of diesel fuel, one gallon. Suppose you and I had to move 80,000 pounds five or six miles up a shallow grade uh, instead of using a truck. We do it by hand. You know, and let's not be Neanderthal about it. Let's not put it on our back. Let's give ourselves a garden cart, and we'll put 250 pounds in at a time, and we'll wheel it five miles, get in the cart, ride back down, unload it, you know, and then load up another uh, 250 pounds. You're lucky if you can do four trips a day, right, or 1,000 pounds a day. 20 miles a day, that's a lot of walking. That's a lot of work. It would take you 80 days to move 80,000 pounds, and a truck does it in five minutes on one gallon of diesel fuel. That is the amount of embedded energy or power in that liquid substance. Every time you fill your car up with, with gasoline, you know, 10 gallons of gasoline is the equivalent of three years worth of human labor. And that substance has infiltrated itself into our culture, become so available, so free, and sold so cheaply you know, what is the true value of oil? If, if you had to move this 80,000 pounds, here's your task. Here's 80,000 pounds. Move it over there, five miles, six miles. Here's your cart, or I'll sell you this gallon of gasoline, this gallon of diesel fuel. How much would you pay for that diesel fuel to be able to do that job in six or seven minutes versus 80 days, four or five months? That is the true value of oil. That is what it is truly worth because of the massive amount of work. And coal and natural gas are these massive concentrations of carbon fuel. And each one of them has their own gift of this massive amount of energy. And we have been, taken these substances and brought them into our culture, and they, are changing. they have changed the way we live on this planet. They have given us a very false sense of reality. And how do we use these incredibly valuable resources. I'm on slide 32. Well, you know, we do work, of course, with it, um, but we do use it for recreation. We use it to heat our homes. Uh, we use it, um, you know, for automobiles or one thing or the other. But I love this picture of the night sky you know, from a satellite uh, of Earth. You know, if we flew over the planet 150 years ago or 250 years ago, you know, other than maybe a, a raging... Uh, forest fire somewhere, uh, you wouldn't see any lights, you know, down there on the planet. Uh, it would be basically dark. But one of the things we do today is with electricity, usually from burning coal or nuclear, we light up the night sky. And you have to, you know, I, I sit here and I look at that and I think we're taking coal, you know, coal out of the ground, uranium, turning it into energy, turning it into light, and lighting the night sky. 200 years from now, when these substances, 50 years from now, my gosh, 20 years from now, when these substances of oil and coal 
become incredibly valuable when the price of gasoline is 20 bucks a gallon. We're going to ask ourselves this question. What was so important about lighting up the night sky? Why would we trade this incredibly valuable substance just to light up the night? I mean, was there some, you know, you know, 200 years from now, you look back and we'll look back and say, what were humans thinking at that time? Was there some, you know, raging dinosaur that, you know, would wander the planet at night and would not touch you if it was, you know, if there were lights on? <laughs> I mean, we have. Are we safer now because there's lights? Were we not safe 200 years ago? Will we not be safe in the future if there's if we're not lighting up the night sky? It's just one of those extravagances. It's just an example of an extravagance that we have allowed ourselves because we think energy is bountiful, endless, and cheap. And um, slide 33. There are many people that are asking the question: Is you know what is the human experience about? You know, when when an animal um, dies in the woods or in a prairie, and assuming it's not consumed by a larger animal, if you draw a three-foot circle around that carcass and just watch that spot for the next several days, the biological activity in that one spot just explodes as all kinds of bacteria, bugs, and environments come in to consume that carcass. But once the carcass is consumed, the area or that spot returns to a state of homeostasis or balance. And there are many people that are looking at us as a human species and saying, is this what's happening to us? We're discovering this substance, this fuel, this food, and we've just gone nuts. Our world population and the way we live has just exploded. And where will we be 200 years from now? I certainly don't know the, the answers to that. And then this slide here, slide 34, are the CO2 levels. And this is where Dr. Suzuki uh, comes in and his quote saying, you know, we don't know what the details of a truly sustainable future are going to be like. But we need options. It has to do with CO2 levels in the atmosphere. This, uh, the, the green line represents CO2 levels. The red line represents the uh, average temperature on the planet. And um, you can see that as the green line rises, so does the red line. And, um, and then when the green line drops or CO2 levels drop, then the temperature of the planet drops. Each one of those bumps there represents an ice age. So the last depression at the very end on the right there was our last ice age 10,000 years ago. And this is where CO2 levels are today. They're way above uh, where they were, um, you know, 10,000 years ago. We've never experienced a time in our history that we know of that we can record through uh, ice core drillings where CO2 levels have been higher than they are today. And that's why Dr. Suzuki says we're walking into a future that we just do not know what's going to be happening and we are going to need to be very creative. We're going to need to be able to observe what's going on. We're going to be able to be, we need to be able to take a look at uh, anything that comes at us and say, is there a resource involved in that? And can we turn, you know, lemons into lemonade? And um, some challenges will be so humongous it'll be beyond our ability to design for um, catastrophes. But there will be a lot of things that will be changing, uh, the slow changes, and we can certainly design around those. And that's what your study in permaculture is going to assist with. One, one other thing we should note probably is the fact that um, there is debate out there as to whether or not CO2 levels uh, are causing uh, global warming. There's uh, very little debate of the fact that it seems or appears as if the planet is warming. Uh, we can see just looking at the polar ice caps, um, are pretty good indication. But there's some debate as to whether or not it's caused by CO2 levels. Anytime, um, you know, politics or money gets involved in a scientific debate, you can be sure that there'll be a lot of conflicting or confusing information out there. So um, uh, whether or not it's conclusive or not, I just don't know. But it certainly makes sense to me that if CO2 levels are higher than they've ever been or that we have can determine they've ever been in tens of thousands of years, it certainly makes sense that maybe we don't want that much CO2 in our atmosphere. And if there's a way we can stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere, and even more important, if there's a way that we can begin to harvest that CO2, uh, put it back in the soil, put it back into trees, back into plants, it certainly makes sense to uh, look at doing that. So if we, just to summarize here, slide 35, the consumption over the last 100 to 150 years, we've used up half the topsoil on the planet. You know, we're the, we're, we've got some of the best soil in the world here, so we're the last one to destroy our soils. We've used up half the oil, half the rainforests are now gone, a third of all the natural gas, and a third of the coal. 
the goal of, of a permaculture design or permaculture in general is to reverse this consumption model into a creation model. Slide 36, we know how to build topsoil while we grow food at the same time. We can do that. We can grow enough healthy food to feed the world. We can repair devastated lands. We can regrow rainforests. We can produce the energy that we need on an annual basis. Uh, we can create resilient communities and cities. We can improve everyone's overall quality of life across the planet. And possibly, possibly we might be able to retard or even reverse global warming. Through the process or through the, through the course of your training, we will be exploring all of these points here. And my goal is that by the time you finish your training, you will look at all seven of these points in, in the affirmative and say, that is true. We can do all these things. But I know that when you look at this list now, I mean, we've all read reports. There's no way everybody can be fed. There's no way to feed the world except with chemicals. Um, you know, we have to burn this stuff to have fuel. We have to do that. We have to pollute our environment in order to have energy. It's just ingrained in us. And I, you know, actually went through periods where I just felt um, discouraged because I didn't think there was a way. But in my process of really digging in deeply into permaculture, I'm totally convinced it is possible to, to live abundantly well and take care of the planet and other people at the same time. And so that's what we're going to be doing, and we're going to explore some of these ideas and techniques uh, throughout the rest of this seminar here. So when I show that list to other people, they say, great, Bill, I understand, you know, you live in Pollyannaville, you know, you've been reading these weirdo books, and, uh, you know, but, you know, come into the real world, Bill. How? Where will the energy come from to develop this culture, to grow the food, or to do everything you think that you can do on that list? And... Um, you know, they ask the question, you know, uh, where will it come from? Or I ask the question, will it come from hydrogen? If you look at 38, will it come from nuclear? Um, you know, hydrogen, I, I'm, I'm certainly not a scientist. I, I can't, you know, speak uh, um, uh, as an expert on any of these things here. But I've done some research on these. And what I do know is it takes, uh, I think it's 3.2 units of energy, usually it's electricity and natural gas, to create one unit of hydrogen. Three units of natural gas and electricity to create one unit of hydrogen. Hydrogen is not a natural form of energy that you can tap into. It's a, it's a way to convert energy into another form of energy. So that's a net loss. If We, we don't want to go down hydrogen because we're going to use more energy to make the hydrogen. How about nuclear? Well, we already talked that it's a finite resource, just like coal and oil, everything else. It's, uh, you know, there's a limit to the amount of um, uranium there is. But, you know, it doesn't even discuss this, the ethical question here. Um, I mean, I'm not against nuclear if we have a way to effectively, positively, and definitively deal with the waste products from nuclear generation, electricity. But we haven't done that yet. We bury that stuff. We hide it. We try to find some place to, st to store it. And now we're, we're creating these toxic substances that we're putting into storage, and our future generations, our children, their children, are going to have to keep an eye on our waste products long into the future because we need to have that electricity now. We are entitled to create something so toxic that it will be it will be dangerous. It will be polluting for not just a thousand years. It will be polluting for a thousand generations. And think of this. There's only been 80 generations since the time of Christ. And we're creating toxic substances for a thousand generations into the future. We have a very serious moral dilemma, I think. Who the heck are we to be creating these kinds of toxic substances for our, for our future um, children? Biodiesel and ethanol is another one. People say, we'll just grow it. We'll just grow corn and we'll grow switchgrass and we'll, we'll grow all these plants and we'll turn them into the, the fuel that we need. But um, when you look into the equation, remember, it takes more energy to produce the grain than it does it. I, I, didn't, I didn't give you the quote, but it's about two, it takes two calories of oil to produce one calorie of corn, uh, at least one, two to three. So if you think you're going to grow corn, as a matter of fact, look at this next quote. For Time Magazine, this is just last year. Look at slide, what am I on, 39, uh, April of last year, the clean energy scam by Michael Grenwald. He said, biofuels aren't part of the solution at all. They're part of the problem. The conclusion is that the demand for biofuels, which is alcohol, ethanol, and diesel, it's driving up the price for all grains, contributing to deforestation of the rainforest and an increase in global warming and hunger. 
you know, I had to include this picture here. I know this is a beautiful shot of, of Iowa, but it's not Iowa. What you're seeing here actually are the Brazilian rainforests. In the foreground there, that's a rainforest canopy. A little patch was preserved. Everything else, everything else was 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 um, was taken down and planted into grains. Um, slide 40. Um, other forms of energy. Where will the energy come from? How about the free energy device? Um, some of you probably uh, are familiar with Nikola Tesla's work and. Um, that he was able to create an, um, a motor of some form that uh, once it was started, it would run itself and provide more energy. Uh, there are some people that say that's available, and I, and I, and I, don't, um, I don't cross that off the, the charts. Um, I think that's a possibility. I mean, energy is surrounding us all the time. Our bodies are nothing but energy. Einstein told us that you know, you know, it looks like matter to us, but it's really not. It's just a different form of energy. So there could be something to that, but it's not available yet. We don't have it, and if it is available, whoever owns it uh, is uh, hiding it. So um, until we get that, we need to be creative. And then I add this thing here, an alien technology. And, um, you know, I do this somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but think about this. Suppose tomorrow, you know, they come. They, the, the flying saucers come down, and they land on the front lawn of every major um, – uh, country on the world, you know, and the door comes down and out they walk. They got two arms, two legs, and they're pushing this little thing, you know, and they talk God's good good language. They talk English, and uh, they say, here you are. Uh, we understand you're all running, going to be running into an energy problem here. Here's a free energy device. This will provide you with all the energy you ever need. You can continue to live your culture the way you are. Don't worry about a thing. Uh, you're set. All we want is half your planet. Or, you know, we want you to be subservient to us. You know, we're going to be nice rulers. Uh, you get to do everything. You still get to go to TGIF on Fridays. You still get to enjoy your movies. Nothing changes, but um, we own the planet now. Would we trade our freedom and our sovereignty for energy? You know, I don't know that answer either. I tend to think that uh, you hit us on the wrong day, we'll do it. So where will this energy come from? Slide 41, where do oil, gas, and coal come from? I mean, where did they come from? Um, quite simply, um, these are just forms of ancient sunlight. Uh, we know that, um, you know, pre times past, prehistoric times, there's massive uh, rainforests and um, uh, bogs and swamps, all this or massive amounts of organic matter. We know the plant shifts, uh, continents uh, uh, rise and submerge. And when the continent submerges and all that organic matter gets covered with ash or rock and gets compressed over millions of years, it turns into solid liquid and gas. It turns into coal, oil, and natural gas. So all we're doing is harvesting this ancient sunlight. The true key to health, the true key to life on this planet is the process of photosynthesis. It is plant matter that provides soil, that builds soil. It is the plant matter that harvests carbon and generates oxygen. It is plant matter that provides us with food and fuel and fiber. It is the wealth of this planet. Carbon, carbon-based fuels. And where do we get carbon from? The atmosphere. It's in the air. That tree outside your door that you think is a big, massive tree the tree did not come from, you know, the soil. It's not like the tree was formed by photosynthesis and the tree root reaches in and pulls a particle out of the soil and puts it into the tree up above. Um, I think it's 93% of the tree outside is made from the carbon in the atmosphere, in air. So we have lots of carbon available for us. As a matter of fact, I think we have an excess of carbon available to us, and we can harvest it in plants. And that's by, that's by which we create really real wealth on the planet. Consider this, slide 43, the amount of sunlight that intersects the Earth in 24 hours. It's more energy than all the conventional oil that has been or ever will be extracted. The energy we need is there. It's available to us. It's right outside the door. Uh, so the next slide, the total global annual consumption of energy, it's 400 quads. It's roughly the equivalent of just 40 minutes of sunlight. Year's worth of energy for all civilized uh, cultures, 40 minutes of sunlight. And consider this, spider silk. 
Spider silk is five times stronger than steel by, by mass and size, and it's made from digester crickets. And for you scientists out there, um, I had this at room temperature. You know, we know that it's possible to um, uh, make these really great fabrics um, um, in, in the laboratory, but it takes a tremendous amount of energy to produce those fabrics. But a spider can make this something stronger than steel by eating crickets. We can, if we just, you know, the common term, the term called uh, biomimicry, if we just watch and study what's happening in nature, we will be able to duplicate a way of living even superior to what we have today, and we don't have to destroy the planet to do it. And that's uh, 45, that's the conclusion that Bill Mollison came up with. When he when he coined the term permaculture, he was a um, uh, an educator at one of the universities. He was teaching uh, agriculture and agronomy. And he was told that, you know, in the early 70s, hey, we're going to green Australia. We're bringing in herbicides, pesticides. Uh, you're going to teach uh, these young people uh, how to do some real, you know, modern-day farming. And um, he refused. Um, he said it's, that's incredibly short-sighted, yet most you'll get two generations out of that, and then you're going to totally destroy your soils. Uh, you're going to turn uh, Australia into a, a greater desert than it even is today. And so he literally he had to quit his job because he refused to do that. And as he described it, he cut a hole in the bush. And it was that during that two-year period that he wrote most of the content that you see in the designer's manual today. The first book that came out was called Permaculture One, but the ideas behind it and the approach uh, were coined in that time in the in the mid 70s. So when we look at permaculture, slide 46, um, what I love about Bill's work is that it didn't just come with this process of how do you do things, but rather it starts with an ethic. It says no matter what we end up doing, we have to first of all take care of the earth. We cannot pollute it and destroy it. Two, we have to take care of people, and we have to take care of people everywhere, all right? Not just, you know, people on this side of the ocean. And the last thing is, is we have to find a way as part of this care of people, sharing the surplus. There's no system in the natural world that hoards resources all for itself, onto itself as an island, and survives. Any species that becomes a dominant species will always eventually fail because it will consume the very things that is required for it to survive on. And we're doing that similarly as people, where we allow certain cultures or certain individuals to accumulate all the wealth. We have to find ways to share the surplus. So he starts with that. And so when we're, when we're really looking at permaculture, it's not really a technique as much as it is about relationship. Permaculture is about our relationship as humans to the world around us. And the question is, will or do we work with the natural abundance flows of our world and our universe, or do we ignore these? So let's take a look at a couple of things here. The first thing I wanted to talk about, one of the most foundational changes we can make on, a, on any landscape really has to do with, uh, with water. If we're dealing in situations where you end up with dry periods and uh, you're looking for ways to hold water on the landscape, the system that they've used, uh, uh, kind of terracing or in permaculture we call it swales, where you actually create an impression, is one of the best and effective methods to do that. Some of you may have seen the video uh, Jeff Lawton put together of a swale and how water moves through the horizon. It's a very effective method for holding water. And very simply, um, you know, you just dig a ditch on contour. Uh, on contour means it's, you know, kind of level. And you dig a ditch and you take the soil and you plop it downhill. And what that does is kind of create this reverse effect. So when water comes down the hill, it hits that swale. And because the swale is level, the water doesn't go left, it doesn't go right, it just backs up in there, and it creates this long pocket across the terrain. It's a very simple thing to do, but every time it rains, that will fill up with water, and over a period of one, two, three days, the water soaks into the ground, slowly but surely, and it takes a long time for that water to move through the soil profile. And all that time, anything that's planted downhill from that water has an opportunity to take advantage of that through its root system. And so in permaculture design, we will plant into that swale system or below the swale uh, in order to capture that water and grow it and turn it into plants. So it's a simple way to dramatically increase production. 
it doesn't have to be on super sloped land. Here's a, a neighbor's property of ours. Actually, Wayne was in our last design course, and this was the design project we did for him. He kind of lives on this low spot in our little prairie situation. And whenever it rained quite a bit, his entire yard, it's new construction, and his entire yard would just turn into this bog. And what we wanted to do was to minimize the amount of water moving across his property. So we dug a swale right on the uphill side of his property. And uh, the next night it rained and we came out the next day and it, you can see how it backs up the water, how it holds it and keeps it right side is dry other side is wet. So now he'll plant all kinds of things along that berm, fruit trees and berry bushes and all kinds of things, and they'll take advantage of that water all year round. Here's another landscape up in Wisconsin. This gentleman is a permaculturist, and uh, he planted rows and rows of uh, hazelnuts. And uh, you can kind of see them on contour uh, on the hill there. It's kind of hard to tell. They get quite a bit of rain up there, and rather than dig swales, he wanted to put his plants closer together. But he has access to a sawmill, and he has access to trailer loads of sawdust and wood chips. So he brought that in and laid it all over the place. So mulch acts as a fantastic sponge as well. So you can grow a lot of things on a hillside that you wouldn't necessarily use flat ground for or what would they call agricultural land. You can grow a lot on a hillside uh, with swales. The next slide gives you an example of what's going on there. To the right and to the left, you can see the hazelnut bushes, and these are about three to four years old. So the first year in the middle, he also, between the rows of hazelnuts, he wanted to have a crop. I mean, why should it just be open? Why should it be grass competing with the crops? And he wanted a crop right away because when he puts the hazelnuts in, the bushes are very small, right? So he planted this big, thick crop of garlic, and in with the garlic, he also planted raspberries. So over the course of the season, the garlic came in, the raspberries started to come up, the hazelnuts took off, and they became dominant, a little bit taller than everything else. And on year two, he switched from harvesting garlic into harvesting the uh, raspberries. And by year four, the uh, hazelnuts had come on, and he started harvesting hazelnuts as well. So it's just a good way of, in a sense, it's called alley cropping, where you have a crop in between the rows of something else. Why just put grass in there or why till it? Why not grow something useful? What's significant about this design compared to traditional farming is look at this. On his farm, he's holding water on the landscape. He's sequestering carbon all year round. I mean, as long as anything's turning green, he's sequestering. As soon as spring comes, everything turns green and he's sequestering carbon. He's building topsoil and fertility every year and, develop, and, and increasing the humus content of the soil. He's not using herbicides, pesticides, artificial fertilizer. He's not, no poisons. And consider this, in the way, especially concerning the hazelnuts. The hazelnuts will continue to produce, and actually the hazelnuts will hit their peak more like around 7 to 10 years. The hazelnut bush hits their peak, and you can cut that hazelnut bush off at the ground, and it will come back, and within 2 to 3 years, you'll, you'll have a, a huge crop of hazelnuts again. He plants one time, and for decades, he has a, a renewable crop coming in year after year after year, and um, he doesn't have to replant. No tilling of the soil. A whole lot less work than tilling. And what's significant about these nut crops, hazelnuts and chestnuts in particular, uh, we, we, we talk about the chestnut because the new chestnut varieties hold a lot of promise. It's a very sweet nut. And uh, if you look at the carbohydrate and protein profile of hazelnut and chestnut, it's almost identical to that of corn and soybeans. Look at the next slide here. Do you remember uh, George Washington Carver and the work that he did in the 1800s of helping the sharecroppers down in the southern states? Just from peanuts alone, he developed hundreds of recipes, and not just for foods, but for things like dyes and paints, uh, adhesives, um, plastics. Uh, Henry Ford and um, Thomas Edison were contemporaries of his. And uh, it was, uh, if you look at the next slide, um, Dr. Carver developed a synthetic rubber from goldenrod. And the Model A, the, the, those cars, uh, the tires were made from this goldenrod synthetic material that George Washington Carver discovered for Henry Ford. And it was Henry Ford and Thomas Edison, both of them, tried to get George Washington Carver to come and work for them. And, uh, of course, he stayed at Tuskegee University and continued to do his research for the farmers there. 
all the things that we make from corn and soy, just think of how corn and soy have permeated our culture. Everything from cereals to bread to crackers, all of these foodstuffs, snack foods that we eat, that we depend on those crops, we can make all of those foods for a variety of nuts. And nuts are a perennial crop, right? It's a chestnut that doesn't peak until 30 years. And then if you take care of that tree, it can live for hundreds of years and you get a crop every year. We can take this kind of annual agriculture and we can turn it into lush, green, and productive perennial agriculture. But we will not do it from the back of a John Deere tractor. We may end up using some tractors. We certainly could probably use the equipment that harvests uh, blueberries. You know, it's a shaking, the, some kind of uh, cherries and stuff. They have this machine that comes up and shakes a whole bush and all the, the berries fall off. Uh, they're experimenting with a shaker to, to harvest hazelnuts that way. So certainly we can come up with some kinds of automation. But if we're looking at trying to find perennial crops, we're trying to find ways to hold our topsoil and to grow foodstuffs, we can certainly find ways to do it with nuts and different types of uh, grains, certainly beans and peanuts and things like that. And how much food can we grow? Can we ever meet the, uh, the mass production that industrial agriculture has done? Well, look at this, biointensive and biodynamic farming gardening methods. Most of you are familiar with these, I'm sure. But um, uh, they've, they've done research to find out if, uh, if, we, if they really took a, a certain square footage, you know, a half an acre, an acre, and they gave it everything they could and really took care of it and, and planted uh, rotational uh, uh, cropping, you know, sequential cropping where you plant things closely and you, you, every time you harvest something, you plant something else. How much food can we get? And in some of these test systems, they actually produce 10 times the amount of food that industrial agriculture can produce. All right? Can we feed the world? Yes. And we don't need all these flat, arable acres either. We can grow food on hillsides using permaculture methods as well. And we can even grow food in very dry areas using permaculture methods. So land that is not considered arable now could actually be turned into food production. It just takes design and desire. So let's, let's take a minute and take a look at what it takes to produce an egg in the industrial agricultural system today. Um, we start by, uh, of course, growing the grains for, for feed uh, for the chickens. Uh, we know it takes uh, two or three calories of oil just to produce uh, the grain. Then we have to um, manufacture all the chemicals, all the herbicides, pesticides, uh, gasoline, and everything we need to, to, to run the system. Then we truck everything here and there. Uh, then we, you know, raise uh, the food or the eggs in these industrial uh, farming situations, CAFOs. CAFOs. Um, you know, it says nothing about the humaneness of how we treat these animals. They're, um, you know, these chickens will never see daylight. They're born in, the, in a factory and they die in a factory. Um, then we transport everything, and then we have to package it and process it and cool it and get it to the grocery store. And if we're lucky, in the bottom right-hand corner, the waste products from the farming operation, from the chicken operation, will end up back on the field. But what does it take to spread that again? Another tractor. More oil, right? So that's what it takes to create an egg. Here's uh, the next slide. is a picture of how you might do it in a permaculture design system. Let's suppose that, you know, every suburban neighborhood and every city block uh, there's a chicken coop with a greenhouse, and uh, the roof is slanted in such a way that the sun comes in in the winter, but it doesn't come in in, in the uh, summer. The greenhouse is very well insulated, so that the sunlight that does come in stays in the greenhouse, so it stays warm, uh, warmer in the winter time. There's a uh, screening between the back half of the greenhouse, the north end of the greenhouse, and the south end of the greenhouse. That's so the chickens can't get in and tear up uh, all of your plants. But all the waste products from your plants can be thrown in, and your chickens can uh, eat that or consume it. Uh, on a slanted roof, you can capture water. You can grow food on that slanted roof. And the water, once it's captured, you can have an automatic watering system set up, of course. But, um, you know, in this situation, now that's a good way to get eggs, and it really doesn't cost hardly anything. You're just taking the waste products from your uh, greenhouse operation, throwing them in, feeding it to your chickens, maybe a little bit of supplemental feed, and um, you've got your eggs. But what else do you get from chickens? Um, you know, the other byproduct is going to be chicken manure. Uh, that's a great fertilizer, and if you compost it, it's pretty hot stuff, but if you compost it, it makes great soil. 
Um, another thing you get from chicken, besides uh, you know just the, the sheer uh, hu- hu- humor factor, <laughs> they're kind of fun animals, and possibly feathers. Uh, you get meat when you harvest the bird eventually, or you can put some other kind of birds uh, in there. Um, you can um, you certainly get um, you know they're animals, so they breathe in ox- uh, CO. Excuse me, they breathe in oxygen and give off CO2. Well, what do plants need to grow well? CO2. So you have a closed greenhouse, and the uh, and the uh, the chickens are breathing, uh, they're alive. They're going to be uh, harvesting oxygen and providing more CO2 for the plants. But there's one other thing that chickens give off that we don't usually take into consideration. In a well-made greenhouse, you can count on this too. In a tight greenhouse, you can count on this. It has to do with heat. If you have enough chickens in your greenhouse in the winter time, it can be zero degrees outside. But these chickens will continue to produce heat all night long, and they will keep your greenhouse above freezing, maybe up around 40 degrees, if you have enough chickens in there. So it can become your heating source for the greenhouse. So you're getting your food, you're getting your eggs, um, you're getting your heat, you're getting your CO2, all from chickens, and you're throwing all your waste products into them. A nice closed-loop system. Now, that's just a very simple design. This picture I pulled out of the uh, Mollison's book, uh, Introduction to Permaculture. And there's only, you know, one paragraph that just basically describes this system. So you can't, you know, it's not like this is a blueprint and you go buy this blueprint and duplicate it. The idea here is just look at the concepts. Look at how these different ideas are stacked together. It's just a a way to stimulate your thinking and ideas. And if you live in a suburban situation, slide 58, why not uh, have a chicken tractor? Where you can haul, uh, you know, this is the, the the back is a little box where they lay their eggs. In the front, there's a handle. There's a watering can in the front, and uh, when they mow the grass down, you mo- pick it up. There's, there's wheels on the back. You pull it onto a part of the grass or part of your lawn that still needs mowing. First thing they do is go for the bugs, and they go for the clover and the little different types of weeds, and then they go for the grass. And when they get it cut just right, you move them on to the next spot. You can harvest your eggs in the back. Let's talk about the suburbs. Um, I want to talk a bit about the hydrological cycles. In a natural system, you have about 40% evaporation, 10% runoff. Um, Underground, you'll get about 25% shallow infiltration, and then about 25% deep infiltration. It is the shallow infiltration that maintains the hydrological cycle under the soil that maintains our stream levels. Um, you know, the Mississippi River doesn't run all year round because there's snow melting in Colorado, and it's the snow melt. Uh, that is the case in some rivers in, uh, in the mountains. But what supplies the water for our rivers, it's the water that moves underground, the uh, hydrological cycle underground that moves underground, and it feeds the streams from underneath. But now when you change the water cycle and you don't have as much water going in, your water levels drop. And every time it rains, then you end up having more runoff. Look at the next slide. In an urban environment, you'll have 30% evaporation, 55% runoff because of all the hardscape. There's no place for water to go. just runs down the sewer, uh, the storm sewer, and the storm sewer. Some of them are connected to the sewage system, and the sewage systems overflow, and all this toxic water, polluted water, runs off into our streams, into our streams. But here's the other factors. You have a 10% shallow infiltration and only 5% deep infiltration. If you look at the last slide, we had 50% stays above ground, 50% goes below ground. On this slide, we got 85% stays above ground, 15% below ground. Is there any reason that we might think that we've been seeing more and more floods in the last, you know, uh, several decades than we have in years before? And that's because there's no place for water to go. It has to go into surface areas. Even in our farming operations, uh, we can't really count on our farming fields uh, absorbing a tremendous amount of water anymore either. Uh, Number one, of course, they don't have the humus content uh, we talked about earlier that they used to have. We went from uh, 10 to 13 percent humus content down to about 1 percent across the country. But secondly, we also are, uh, most of the farmers around here uh, put drainage tile into their their land. It's a flexible plastic pipe that uh, allows water to go down about one, two, three, four feet, and then it takes, absorbs that water and pulls it off the field. The equipment these days is very heavy, and in order to get the equipment in in the spring to um, work the fields and plant, um, the fields have to be dry enough. And so this pulls the water off the field more quickly, 
uh, allowing them uh, quicker access to the ground. Uh, it also uh, will allow lower ground to drain more quickly. Uh, corn does not grow real well or beans in a soggy in soggy soil. So if they can drain the moisture away, um, they have a chance of getting a little better yields. So we've changed the hydrological cycles, and um, probably most of us are aware that um, you know you've read articles for the last uh, 15, 20 years where they say the uh, water tables are dropping, wells are turning dry, not to mention the farm chemicals that are showing up in our wells. So we have to figure out ways to return the hydrological cycles. And the easiest way to do that in a suburban environment is with rain gardens. Uh, Kansas City in the metro area, they had this big goal several years ago to put 10,000 rain gardens in, and I believe they surpassed that goal. Uh, all over the city now they're putting these in. So when water comes off the roof or moves across the landscape, it just runs into this shallow impression. You dig a shallow impression, put a lot of uh, deep prairie plants in there. Some of the roots from some of these native prairie plants will go 18 feet down into clay. And so you have a little pit, the water sits in there, the roots suck it down, and you're harvesting uh, all that excess rainwater. So I want to take you to um, our front yard uh, to show you how we've incorporated the rain garden concept along with the swale concept. The idea, of course, in permaculture is to slow water down. Um, and so we, uh, one of our design courses a couple of years ago, um, we had the students, um, you know, they had the choice to sit in the classroom and listen to us talk or to come outside and and uh, dig these rain guards with us. And so I, I would say we probably didn't spend more than four or five hours total over three days digging all these rain gardens and building the berm. Um, so it was a really fun project. The students had a great time. But it's really a simple design. Um, it, our front yard was basically plain. There was nothing in our yard except for this little uh, red, uh, small little red bud tree. You can kind of see it there in the front. Um, and what we did is we blocked the rain gutter on the far end of the, the, excuse me, the downspout on the far end of the house. You can see it on our house there, which would force all the water to come into on the right-hand side. You can't see it in the picture, but the downspout on the right-hand side of the house. So now all the water from two-thirds of our roof comes down this one downspout. We connected it to a, it's really just a ditch. A swale is more of a ditch on contour. This is more of just a, um, um, a clean ditch. And um, the water comes down to fills rain garden number one on the right, works its way down along the sidewalk, fills up rain garden number two. And then there's another little um, path that leads to a rain garden number three. You can't see the rain garden, but it's just uh, beyond rain garden number two. And then when rain garden number three overflows, you can see the berm along the back, the black st uh, stretch of dirt there right along um, between our two properties there. We took all the dirt, put it along that berm, so the water overflows, it hits that berm, and then it starts working its way down the berm back towards the back of the house, all the while soaking up water in all three rain gardens and the berm, and we are holding the water on the landscape. Actually, it's been a couple of years now, and I've never seen a rain event. We've had five inches of rain, seven inches of rain in less than, I think it was, uh, 14 hours once, and um, it, we had a lot of water, but none of it, I mean, it didn't make it all the way down to the end of the berm. We have soaked in thousands of gallons of water in those in those rain events. So if you look at that picture, slide 64, that's in, um, that was actually Thanksgiving Day, and the next picture shows that uh, probably, that's probably June, maybe July, the following year. We put in a path system. The paths are really nice. It was very simple. We dug out the sod and we moved it in the backyard. We've got a berm back there, but um, we filled it with wood chips. It's really nice how it gave it a sense of uh, tranquility. It started dividing up our yard into different areas, so now we have this part over here, this part over there, and um, it really, um, I think it's beautiful. I, I, you know, I never spent any time in our front yard except to mow it. Uh, maybe when the boys were small, I'd be out there, we'd play ball or something. But it's just open, it's sunny, it's uninteresting. But now, uh, once we put these rain gardens in, we started planting. We have, um, Becky and I have counted, we've got about 40 edible items in our front yard now. And everything is still young. You know, we're not going to live off of these little teeny blueberry bushes in the front. But, you know, over a period of five years, this will become a very bountiful area. We'll be producing lots of food. And um, I just, I love being in our in our front yard now. The next picture shows the uh, berm. Um, this is when we were building it. Uh, we just dumped all the soil in a big, long row right down the property line. And 
and then the next slide just shows it to you uh, the next summer. Uh, on that burn, we've got uh, gooseberries, currants, raspberries, strawberry, onion, green beans, white clover, and comfrey. This year, we've added uh, what have we got there now, Beck. We got some cabbage in there, some collard greens. I think we've got uh, a whole row of potatoes, um, and the daylilies are in there too. So we're eating all of those things. Backyard. This is the the uh, water tank. Um, we started with a 55 gallon drum, but those of you who've you've captured roof water in a 55 gallon drum, in a good rain event, you know that they fill in about two minutes. So um, I went out and bought this. This actually, if you could see the cutouts on the side of this water tank here, it fits into the back of a pickup truck. So um, it um, it's they make them by the bazillions. So it's relatively cheap. This whole tank cost me 220 bucks, and uh, it holds 425 gallons. So that's roughly the equivalent of eight. 55 gallon drums and it's all in one big container and um, and then Becky and I went ahead and built this little structure to get it up off the ground it's just a little bit below the gutter level you know the top of the tank is just two inches below the gutter level that's by how we decided how high it should be so water will flow downhill and then from there when you th when that thing fills up and you throw the valve this water comes crashing out of it so it uh, makes it very easy to do, to do watering and we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, during your course. I'll get into more detail. But now we've got uh, lath on the side. We're going to be planting grapes and kiwis, so it'll be a structure to hold, uh, to grow food. Uh, Becky started growing uh, some mushrooms underneath as well because it's a cool, dark, uh, shaded area. So uh, we'll, we'll, max, we'll maximize um, you know, the, uh, what we use. We'll stack functions. This picture here is a, of uh, one of the evergreens we have in our back yard. Uh, we have three trees and they've kind of grown up. They're kind of a wind protection, but they've gotten so big they're blocking out a lot of sunlight. We wanted to do some annual agriculture in this one bed here. So we decided we'd take the middle tree out. And so uh, rather than cut the tree down and then try to cut all the limbs off uh, to um, to store the carbon, uh, we always save all the branches. Every All the branches and leaves, anything that comes off of our lot, we save and we turn it back into soil. But uh, I went ahead and cut the, the, the branches off while it's standing vertical. It's a little easier to lop them off standing up than laying down. And I got as high as I could reach, and then um, I went in to get the uh, saw to cut it down at the base. And Becky's standing out there when I come out. She says, you know what? I kind of like that the way it is. She says, it reminds me of a Dr. Seuss tree. I think it's kind of cute. Why don't we leave the post in the ground right where it is instead of you know burying a post and creating a, a structure to tie um, – you know, some string on for our vining plants, uh, we can just leave it as a living post. We don't have to replace the post every seven to eight years. We can just leave the tree as alive, and that way that it's a living post, and we don't have to replace the post. So we decided that we'd plant our beans, and we, you know, put up some, um, tied up some twine for them to grow on, and away they go. But we must have been gone the week, we were probably doing a design course, the week that they reached the top of the string, because there was nobody there to tell them, okay, you're there, you're done, go ahead and stop. You know, you're at the top. So they just kept on growing. And they, if you look at the next slide, they ended up growing through the entire top of the tree and coming out the top. We had this beautiful crop of beans growing at the top of this evergreen tree at about 14 feet. I had to get the uh, ladder out to, uh, to harvest the beans. And they were delicious beans. But uh, this is just a reminder. I mean, how many of us have vertical landscaping that doesn't produce food, but we can convert it into food production just by uh, how we, what we grow next to it? Um, these great big leaves you see on these bean plants, the bean plant, uh, the vining bean plant, is not um, a desert plant. It's not a prairie plant. It's a forest plant. You know, we call them leaves, but they're actually great big solar collectors. And at any given time, maybe only 25% of the leaves are in sunlight. But that's all that the plant needs in order to produce a very healthy crop of beans. If you look at the next picture, another understory vining plant is the squash plants. And um, in, in front of this evergreen, um, we had a, I think Becky, I think it was a volunteer butternut squash. And we had a, gosh, the vine must have been 20 feet. It was growing out into the yard. But one of the vines got away from us, went behind uh, behind uh, uh, this tree, went up through the base of the tree, and we didn't even notice it. And I come around the back of the tree later on in the summer, and here's this butternut vine squash growing through the side of the tree. So I went ahead and I pulled back the branches, and look at uh, slide number 72. Look at what I found. That's an 8-inch butternut squash, 8- or 9-inch butternut squash, growing at about 6 feet off the ground. How many of you have a butternut squash tree sitting in your backyard? You didn't even know it. 
The next slide, uh, 73, is a picture of our peach tree. Um, that's Becky. We probably got, I don't know, three or 400 peaches off of this one tree. Now, listen, peaches are difficult to grow, um, and, you know, we haven't had great success. This was the big year. We planted the tree and, you know, nothing for a couple of years, and then we got three peaches and then 12 and then 24 and then this year. Um, but, uh, you know, that's the, that is the way nature works. You know, if I was a peach farmer and I was dependent upon every tree to do this every year and I had one bad year, I'd be out of business. But if you're a permaculturist, you know, you have 20, 15, 20, th maybe 30 varieties of fruit trees in your own backyard, and some trees have two or three different varieties grafted onto the same tree. You've got quite a variety. And so if you if two or three or five trees have a bad year, so what? You have so many other trees that are doing so well, you have plenty of food, plenty of bounty. I think we preserved enough uh, um, peach uh, preserves and uh, frozen peaches and uh, for pies and stuff that lasted us into about almost a year and a half. So um, this picture here uh, is a typical suburban backyard situation. The next picture is our friend um, Ron and uh, Vicki uh, up in uh, Downers Grove. Their last name is Snowicky. This is their backyard. Look at how beautiful that is. Our backyards can be highly productive and very beautiful. On the left-hand side there, you can see this kind of this vining thing. That's actually a winter hardy kiwi, and it grows so well. You know, he has to slash it back every year. And uh, I was there one fall when the kiwis were coming in, and uh, my gosh, they're not the—they're not your normal kiwi with all the hairy fuzz on them. They're uh, like the size of a small plum, and they're smooth-skinned. And you just pop one into your mouth, and it's just absolutely delicious. So we can all grow winter, winter hardy kiwi, and we can all make our backyards and our front yards beautiful. Just because we're growing food doesn't mean it has to be in rows and be really ugly looking. Picture 76 is of village homes. This is an example of a community that designed was designed permaculturally. All the water uh, is collected in swales, so they harvest the rainwater. They get 18 inches of rain. This is Davis, California, by the way. This is right up next to the University of um, California there. And um, um, so they harvest the rainwater. They're able to grow trees. They have fruit trees, and they have a, a vineyards. Um, Everywhere you go in the community, we'll, you'll see a short film uh, about this uh, at your course. Uh, there's fruit growing everywhere. But what is significant, they put an almond crop in. This is California. They put an almond crop in, and the almond crop belongs to the entire community. They have a farmer that they pay to harvest it, but the profits from that harvesting operation go to the community to help cover maintenance costs on other areas of the community. So there's no reason every community couldn't be full of food and actually producing a cash, a cash crop for the citizens. Um, we did a design course last uh, fall. Uh, Wayne and I uh, taught one in Grass Valley, and uh, one day we took our students, we took them down to uh, Davis. We wanted them to see village homes. And I was looking at this hedge here and just thinking, uh, I was actually was looking at the gardens and noticing the hedge, and uh, Wayne says, hey, Bill, take a look at this. And he pulls back a branch, look at slide 78. That's a pomegranate. Um, that's a hedge that they've made into what looks like a very traditional-looking hedge, but it's growing food at the same time. The next picture shows Wayne on top of a house. This is a roof. Matter of fact, uh, in the film that we show you, uh, Bill Mollison is standing in the exact same place 20 years earlier. So you'll be able to see a before and after shot of that. And I wanted to share this little snippet with you as well. The next slide, um, slide 80. This looks like a very traditional suburban environment, doesn't it? Houses and cars and streets and same old, same old. Twenty years ago, some um, two neighbors decided to take the fence down between their house. They both had children and they decided to kind of cooperatively take care of their kids and grow food and kind of created this nice situation between their two households. And then the house behind them, on the op opposite street, but behind them, um, became available. And they decided, let's buy that house. We'll rent it out to college students. This is also Davis, California. We'll rent it out to college students. We'll take that fence down, and then we'll invite whoever rents that space to kind of join in, you know, this kind of community process that we're setting up. But if nothing else, we'll use their backyard to do gardening as well. Well, over a period of 20 years, they formed a, a cooperative, an association. It's called, look at the next slide, the N Street Co-Housing Unit, or co Cooperative. 
and they ended up buying every house on the block. The cooperative owns all the houses. Everybody rents their house from the cooperative. They took down all the fences, and if you look at the next several pictures, they turned it all into patios and garden areas. They've got a meeting room. They have a patio area that they can all meet. Um, there's gardens left. There's gardens right. There's food everywhere. They have a grassy area that they kept in there, so you know you can play croquet or kids can run around. You can run your dog or walk your dog. But uh, slide 86, I really got a kick out of this. You see all the telephone wires in there. That's the very middle of the block. This is where the alley used to be, all right? This is where this mulberry tree is now. There's no alley anymore. And you got all these wires running through. But there's this massive, probably a 50-foot-tall mulberry tree loaded with berries. And I noticed that there was a fence with grapes on it all the way around the base of the tree, you know, about where the drip line is. So I went over there and I uh, looked behind the fence to see what was on the inside of the fence and look at what I found the next slide. Chickens. You see any mulberries on the ground? Not a one. They're harvesting every single mulberry off of that tree because when it lands on the ground, it goes into the chicken and it creates some of the richest, reddest yolk eggs that you'll ever eat. And so they're taking this bountiful crop. Those of you who've harvested mulberries or eat mulberry know that, you know, you can harvest a lot of them, but you can't harvest all of them. There's just way too many of them, and they're too hard to get to. And uh, so anything that ends up in the ground still ends up in an egg, and they get to get the benefit of it. Uh, next slide, a uh, picture of Enright Ridge Echo Village. This is a group of folks in uh, Cincinnati that are doing the very same thing. Uh, slowly but surely, they're um, uh, purchasing uh, houses along this block. This block, this neighborhood is over 100 years old. These are old buildings. And they're slowly converting them, making them energy efficient, taking down the fences, and they're creating a really strong neighborhood experience there, uh, cooperatively doing all kinds of things. What this means to me is it doesn't matter what neighborhood we live in, whether it's in the city, whether it's in an apartment building, whether it's in the suburbs, we can turn our any of those environments into very uh, positive, productive uh, community environments that provide us for, with food and with safety, and with community. And on the energy feature here, uh, slide 89, here's a picture of Stephen and Rebecca Wren. They wrote this great book, just came out this year, The Carbon Free Home. And it's a perfect example of, you know, rather than building this perfect house, you know, 30 miles out in the country and having five acres, matter of fact, they did this. And they had, in, they were on the cover of, you know, Solar Magazine, 1993 or something like that. The perfect couple, the perfect house, and it was straw bale, it was energy free and all this kind of stuff. And then they measured their carbon footprint. Every time they wanted to go to work, every time they wanted to, or didn't want to go to work, uh, every time they wanted to see friends, any time they wanted to shop, they had to drive to town. And the carbon footprint of all that driving was a massive amount of energy. So they ended up selling that dream home. And besides, they didn't even have community. After a while, they just said, why are we out here by ourselves? Let's go back to town. They bought a 75-year-old house. They spent quite a bit of time and money retrofitting this house to the point where now they, they're calling it carbon-free because they're generating all the energy that they need to run their household. Now, it cost a good buck. It took a while to get it to that point. The point is it is possible. Uh, what's their ROI? What's their return on investment? Uh, they didn't do it for that reason. But you can be sure that in the coming years, when the price of energy starts really going nuts, they're way ahead of the game. And when all of us decide to make our homes energy efficient at the same time, and all of us want solar panels, and all of us want to do all these different things to make our, ener our homes energy efficient, the price of doing all that is going to go way up too. So now is a good time to do it. And in the cities, uh, let's look at a few examples here. Uh, gardening in the city is probably one of the most revolutionary things you can do. Growing your own food locally. And when people, especially people who've never had their hands on the soil, don't even know where their food comes from, we change people's lives when they put their hands in the soil, when they put their hands in a garden. First time a child grows a radish and picks it themselves and eats it, it their lives are never the same. So, uh, matter of fact, Jeff Lawton says all the world's problems can be solved in a garden. Another one of those Pollyanna statements. But when you think really deeply and hard on that sentence, you'll discover that really it, it's true. You know, when you're secure, when you have your food, when you have your shelter and you have neighbors that you can count on, you have what you need and you 
you don't have the need to take advantage of others. The next picture shows a rooftop in a city. You think about the price of real estate in any city. My gosh, the most valuable real estate they have per square foot are their rooftops. You can grow, have beauty. You can grow food. And certainly the Chicago is uh, taking a strong lead in the major cities in greening up a lot of roofs. But um, this is this roof here on slide 92 is probably pretty expensive. You know, that looks like a lot of landscaping that was done in there. Not very much food. But look at the next slide. This is in Portland, Oregon. How much money do you think they spent on this high-tech uh, bed system here? I don't know if you can see that picture very well, but I think that's a $7 kitty tub, <laughs> waiting tub. So they put those up there, you know, hauled some topsoil up there. I think this is 17th floor in a building in Portland. And, um, well, it can't be that high because I can see the trees there. But um, um, does it have to be complicated? Does it have to be hard? No, there are simple ways to grow food on rooftops. Look at the next slide. This is the Gary Comer Youth Center. Um, we have taken some of our students here. This is a fabulous project. This is in a very tough neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. Um, a lot of the kids here are, just need a safe place to be after school, so it's an after-school place and goes until, I think, 9 o'clock at night. But um, one of the things they did, well, if we're going to help students uh, and give them a balanced way of uh, um, a balanced perspective on life, they have to be able to know what it, where their food comes from. So if you look at the next slide, they put a garden up at the top. They have a rooftop garden up there. And uh, this is a fall shot, so everything's kind of turning brown, so it's not as uh, green and lush. But uh, they grow everything from herbs to tomatoes to, oh, here's the next picture, pe peanuts. A lot of these kids, um, their um, grandparents uh, come from down south, and they grow collard greens and different types of greens and peanuts and things, foods that uh, their grandparents and great-grandparents are familiar with. They, one year they grew, um, or every year they grow tomatoes and basil, and uh, they have a day where the parents come up and they harvest the tomatoes and the basil, and they go home with a recipe and they all make uh, spaghetti that night. So it's a powerful experience for kids. Uh, next picture is just this little uh, little cold frames that they got, uh, and they're growing they're growing that spinach all winter long on that roof. And look at the pumpkin that they grew uh, in this one slide. That's that's a rooftop in in uh, <laughs> rooftop in uh, in uh, Chicago. Also, in the urban environment, we need to seriously look at vertical space. Uh, so much is covered with buildings and rooftops. Uh, what about the walls? What about the um, sides of buildings? And take a look at this picture. Here's a, a simple little, they call them outdoor living wall panels. I think these are about maybe two-foot square panels. But imagine, I mean, this is a little bit gaudy, but imagine you had maybe four of those, uh, two on either side of your window, and you lived on the fourth-floor apartment in, uh, in a city. And you could open up your window, and you've got radishes on one side and lettuce on the other. There's no reason we can't be creative in adapting um, simple things. It would just require daily watering, and uh, you could grow f uh, food right outside your, your windows. The next slide, um, here's uh, woollypocket.com. They've come up with a simple method. This is uh, all recycled materials, and they spin it into these uh, pockets that allow excess water to, to leak out, but it still and allows air into the root system. But uh, you could stack these quite high and in any kind of an environment and uh, grow quite a, a wide variety of um, uh, small vegetables. The next slide shows buckets growing uh, tomatoes, upside-down tomatoes, tomatoes coming out of the bottom, and you can grow um, uh, lettuce and stuff out of the top of a bucket. Um, you know, very simple, low-tech, doesn't cost anything, not like, you know, you don't have to buy something to do this. You can be creative using your own things. Another way of using vertical space, I took some pictures at the Chicago Botanic Gardens. It's, it's in the process of espalier. Uh, some of you are familiar with this process. It's very simple. You take a, a small fruit, fruiting tree, apples is a common one, but certainly pears, peaches, plums, anything would work. You start growing it against a wall or a fence or even on its own, and you have some guide wires. I think you can see the, there's uh, three guide wires on there. And as the plant grows, you start training limbs to go along the wire. If you look at the next slide, you can see uh, here's a tree that's probably about 20 years old and how beautiful it looks and uh, how productive it could be in um, covering up a wall. Why have a you know, big, ugly wall when you could be growing food? If you look at the next slide, it's a photo from uh, Woodbridge Fruit Trees. Um, you don't need to have a wall. You can plant fruit trees in a row, and over time, uh, as they grow, um, actually graft them into one another and make a continuous fence. 
with fruiting trees. Next slide shows uh, another wall covered with espalier and loaded with apples. If I'm going to have a wall and I'm going to, you know, have a fence, uh, I'd rather have it growing food than just uh, have it plain old wood. The next slide shows a, a variation in espalier. It doesn't have to be uh, horizontal. Uh, you can actually create a, this is a fan pattern. Uh, very pretty. I think it's a pear tree. And what about overhead space? Covering any kind of uh, arbor uh, so that you, you create a shady environment and yet you grow food. Look at the next slide. Look at the grapes growing. This is all at the uh, up at the Chicago Botanic Gardens. Uh, and it doesn't have to be high-end or really expensive. We can create arches out of very inexpensive materials. This next slide shows one made out of rebar, rebar that's formed into an arch. They plant the um, fruit trees along them, and as they grow, they look at the next slide, they grow together at the top, they um, blend together. You create a very shady environment in the summer. You've got fruit hanging down from, the, uh, from above. It's very easy to harvest and pick. And in the wintertime, the leaves fall and you got sunlight coming through again. The next picture just shows how pretty it could be as well. You know, our gardens don't have to just be functional. Uh, they can be functional and beautiful at the same time. Um, moving on to the Chicago Center for Green Technology, I love this little technique they had here. They had these large water tanks. I think they're 2,500 gallons, 2,500 gallons coming off of the roof. And rather than just having a you know, corrugated metal tank out there, they went ahead and put lattice up and started growing vines on it. I think these are trumpet vines, but look at the second picture here. Um, the vines have completely taken over the tank. Uh, it keeps the tank shaded, keeps the water cool, and you have something green to look at instead of a, a metal tank. And there's no reason that couldn't be grapes and uh, kiwi, even <laughs> string beans for that matter. Um, there's no reason we can't cover that lattice and create a very beautiful environment. So this picture here is the um, Chicago uh, Honey Co-op. This is a picture of uh, uh, Michael Thompson. And I heard about Michael's work, and I went up to uh, meet him one day. I wanted to see his uh, the uh, apiary. I wanted to see what he was doing with the bees and everything. And there's a picture. You see the Sears Tower in the background uh, behind all those um, the uh, towers there, bee towers. But... Um, what was interesting about this is uh, the honey is very eclectic. Uh, just like the Chicago is a melting pot uh, of the human population, it's also a melting pot for weeds. Uh, I think over the last uh, couple of centuries, the number of trucks and wagons and things that have come through the city and uh, dropped weed seeds from all over the world. And there's a lot of empty and abandoned lots in Chicago. So there are weeds growing from March all the way through November. There are plants, weed plants flowering. And these bees just have a great time. They find honey, uh, nectar everywhere. And the honey is this exquisite tasting honey. So they package it in this really high-end jar, and they sell it to uh, as top dollar to uh, local restaurants and um, boutique shops in Chicago and get top dollar for it. And the people who do the work, as Michael calls them, he says they are the underemployed. These are mostly people that have been in prison. They're out. They have close to no chance in heck of finding a job. And he says we don't just employ them. He says we teach them the business. They learn how to grow, how to raise bees. They learn how to package. They learn how to sell. They learn how to run a business. And by the time they're done working with uh, the bee operation for a couple of years, they can start their own their own business. But what was interesting about this to me is I turned around and I said, well, Michael, look at slide 102. What's going on back here? This looks like a garden area. He said, oh, yeah, that's our community garden project. We had some of the people working with us wanted to grow food, and there's some, some soil back there, so we started putting in some gardens. And I went over and looked at the soil, and I see rock, and I see broken glass, I see cinders. And I said, well, gosh, it's kind of nasty stuff, isn't it? And he says, well, he says, we made a deal with the horse track they were bringing truckloads of their stable sweeping, straw manure, and they would bring it and dump it right on the concrete. We'd let it break down for a year. Then we'd take wheelbarrows, and we'd take it out there, and we'd stack it two and a half feet high, and we would plant right in the compost. And so um, all the plants that you see are actually in compost. They're not in this, you know, this crummy soil. But I'm looking at these other piles on the concrete, and I said, what's going on here? He says, well, you know, we started seeing weeds come up, you know, this, these piles, we couldn't use it all. We didn't transport it all over to the garden. Some of it's still sitting on the concrete. 
And weeds started coming up, and I thought, well, gosh, you know, if we can grow vegetables over there on top of that ground, why can't I just grow vegetables here? I just got to be sure that the the beds get watered. So he planted, um, started planting vegetables. And one year he had like 25 different varieties of vegetables in these mounds all over the concrete. If you look at the next picture, you can see the variety of plants and flowers and vegetables that he's growing. Now, this is on concrete. You think we might be able to find some abandoned concrete in the city of Chicago so we could grow some lush gardens like this? All it takes is soil. You've got sunlight, you've got water, if you've got rain, if you've got hose. All you need is soil, and you can create beauty anywhere. What I really loved was his, um, in the fall we went back, we took a, course, a class up there, and uh, harvesting sweet potatoes. If any of you have harvested sweet potatoes, it's a lot of digging. They get down there about 14, 15 inches. You really have to dig deep. It's a lot of work. All Michael did is he took the shovel, he slid it along the, the concrete, slammed it into the side of the pile, shook the shovel up and down to loosen the soil, then he grabbed the sweet potato by the plant by the throat and picked it up, and there's all these sweet potatoes hanging right from his hand. Totally untouched, unblemished, perfect condition. I'm telling Becky, I said, I want to pour a concrete pad in our backyard so I can grow sweet potatoes like Michael. So there's hope for the city. I mean, we got rooftops, we've got concrete. Um, we can grow food anywhere. Uh, this next picture shows you uh, this uh, on the left-hand side. This is a schoolyard, a uh, school in the background. This what was was an asphalt concrete, an asphalt parking lot. Now it's a flower garden and vegetable garden for children. Uh, next picture is the Chicago Center for Green Technology, solar and green roofs up there. Another interesting project they're looking at down in uh, St. Louis, this is on the drawing boards from what I understand, is um, restoring an industrial building that's only like four blocks from downtown uh, St. Louis. It's called Culverway Echo Village. Uh, the plan is, is to convert this uh, manufacturing facility, this old uh, building, into a whole series of condominiums with all kinds of shared facilities. Um, you know, they'll have um, dining areas, they'll have greenhouses, they'll have common areas like gardens, um, possibly shops, uh, laundries. It's, if you can imagine, everybody doesn't have to have everything in their own apartment. They can share a lot of this stuff. The cost for these apartments would be very low, and they would all be within walking distance uh, of downtown Indianapolis, uh, excuse me, St. Louis, so people would not need automobiles necessarily. Um, it's very creative. We can take old buildings, old areas, and refurbish them uh, and do it in a very cooperative way to save uh, costs of energy and the cost of living. And then finally, commercial and public applications. This is a picture of the uh, AGL Center in uh, at Overland College. Look at all that glass. I look at this building and I think, boy, what an energy drain. But this building, because of the way it was designed, and because of the way they hold heat, processes water, it uses 80% less energy than any other building on campus by square foot. We have the ability to design buildings that will not only generate all the energy that they need just by standing there, but over the life of the building will generate an excess amount of energy that can be fed into a grid and that in effect will end up offsetting the energy invested in the very materials and and in the process of building the building in the first place. So you end up with a net carbon situation. That's what we need. We need to be building buildings that operate the same way as a tree, that produce more than they consume. And we know how to do it. We can do it. Is it more expensive? Yeah. <laughs> but we do it anyway because it's the right thing to do. And in the long run, when the price of energy goes up, it's a smart thing to do economically. The next slide is a permaculture greenhouse, and um, we're going to spend an hour at your course talking about uh, greenhouses. I've been looking into these uh, quite a bit. I've never built one, but I've come across a lot of interesting information. Imagine, look at the next slide, imagine we could have a greenhouse, a permaculture greenhouse that grew the exact same vegetables 365 days a year or 52 weeks a year. And I'm not talking about just tomatoes or lettuce. I'm talking about all winter long. Imagine you walk into the greenhouse. The date is January 23rd, you know, and you're going in there and you're going to harvest lettuce and broccoli and tomatoes and green beans and zucchini, all the things that we love to eat all year long that we buy from the grocery store. 
Now, if you could produce that, obviously you're going to need a heat source that doesn't cost a lot of money, that doesn't create pollution. You're going to need light because you're going to have to have to, – to get vegetables, you have to have light. You can grow greens in the winter, but you, to get something to turn color, you've got to have light. So you have to have turn lights on in the morning and the evening. But if there were a way to do that, do you think you could find a couple of neighbors that would be willing to um, – you know, pay you 50 bucks a week for a big basket of fresh vegetables, their CSA, and uh, provide them with a fresh basket of organic fresh vegetables every week. And if the greenhouse was just big enough that you could do 20 of those a week, that's a 1000 bucks a week growing vegetables in a greenhouse in your backyard. To me, that's the goal. That's what we have to do. As long as we're going to be living here in the temperate climate zone, We've got to find ways to use simple technology to create greenhouses to produce food. Obviously, we can do a lot with storage. Uh, we can do a lot with microgreens. We can do a lot of other things. But if we're going to live up here, we're going to have. To, um, it would be nice to have foods that were um, uh, fresh and uh, delicious. And but at the same time, if we're going to do it, we have to do it responsibly. We have to do it in such a way that we do not pollute the planet and consume it. So what are we trying to do here? What was this all about? Why are we taking a design course? What we want to do is we want to figure out a way to provide for our current needs. We want to bring decency and dignity to all people. This is everywhere. We want to assure abundance for future generations. We want to repair, if possible, the damage to our planet. And we can repair a lot of it. And if possible, reverse or retard global warming. The good news is nature will work with us. Look at this next picture. Look at this. This is a rock, right? And that's probably six to eight inches of topsoil there. And look at the trees growing right out of that rock. Life wants to grow. Life wants to expand. Nature is doing everything it can to work with us. The question is, look at the next slide, will we work with nature? The truth of that photo, it's the same picture, actually. I just pulled the camera back a little bit is that this really isn't an, a rock outcropping. What this is, is the Smoky Mountains. Um, we, it's cheaper now, uh, you know, instead of going underground and uh, looking for coal seams and taking it from underground, with dynamite and large equipment, we found it's cheaper and easier just to blow up mountains, to pull the uh, coal from the seams, and, uh, and harvest it that way. And what do we do with that coal? Mostly we generate electricity. We light up the night sky with it. We're trading our Smoky Mountains to light up the night sky. So we have to find alternatives, and we can. So what's genuinely possible to create? You know, with the sun, all the energy we need is right there, plus soil, the magic solution, plus water and air, and a permaculture design, careful thought, designing for the seventh generation, care of earth, care of people, no waste, no pollution, equals productivity, security, sustainability, and I think a genuine possibility for peace. If people are cared for, there's no reason to go to war. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Thoreau. He says, you know, what is the use of a home if you haven't got a tolerable planet to put it on? <laughs> it's pretty to the point, right? Um, so what's going on? Where are we at today? I think Becky and I talk about this a lot, and, but you know, I think that we as a species, we as the human species, are being or a mirror is being hold, held up in front of us because of the way we live. You know, you could get away with it for a while with just a few people. You can pollute and pollute and consume, and it doesn't catch up to you for a while. But now there's no place to run. There's no place to go. The mirror's being shown up. So what life is actually asking us to do is to just step into a greater experience of ourselves. I kind of look at us like um, adolescents. Imagine we're teenagers, we're home, and mom and dad are gone for the weekend, all right? So the house is ours. We call our friends, come on over, it's a party, you know, the liquor cabinet's open, the refrigerator's open, we're eating pizza and all the garbage food we can, the TV's on, the stereo's on, the front door's open, the furnace is on. We're just consuming, we're just unconsciously having this party, and what's interesting, it's not even that much of a party anymore, is it? You know what I mean? How many of us work way more than our, our parents did? What life is asking us to do is to just stop for a second and look and just say, what's going on? What is it that we've created? And it is time for us just to step into our adulthood. It's time for us just to grow up, 
it's time for us to just say, enough. Enough is enough. It's time to fix what we've done. Let's be responsible. Let's heal the things that we've damaged. And let's find ways to leave the planet in better condition than when we found it. Remember the Boy Scout? Leave the campsite in better condition than you found it. That's what this is about. That's what we're up to. So the last slide is, these are the closing words of the UN Earth Charter. I find these um, so inspiring. It says, you know, let ours be a time remembered for the awakening of a new reverence for life, for the firm resolve to achieve sustainability, for the quickening of the struggle of justice and peace, and for the joyful celebration of life. What we are about and what we are facing is going to be challenging, but it does not have to overtake us. It does not have to become a dirge. We can create a future for ourselves that will be bountiful, and we can have a great time in the process of getting there. 